You're listening to The Valley Current. There you go. Well, welcome in. Steve Rabin is here. He's the, the CPA of fame in Silicon Valley and uh, really all of Northern California. So, Steve, welcome. I haven't seen you for a while. I think you were stressed by the tax season that we were going through for people who extended their returns. But as you noted, it got delayed for about another month. Didn't it, didn't it get pushed from October 15th, which then was, what, October 17th to some date in November now? It's now November 16th um, for uh, people who were affected by the California floods, which includes all of my clients because they have their tax records at my office and I'm located in a California flood zone. So um, anybody who's listening to this who still wants to file timely um, can do so through me. It's funny. So you 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 allow for an automatic extension for anyone that's that's late, effectively, right? Yes. So I'm I'm curious when you look at the number of tax seasons that you've been through. Do you say to yourself, "Hey, I've got a solid thirty more annual tax seasons ahead of me"? Like there's there's only a certain. You tell me who the oldest CPA is that does tax work. And I'd like to know, like, how many consecutive years has he or she filed tax returns? There must be someone that's got the Guinness Book of World Records on that, right? I have um, heard from uh, tax preparers with over 10,000 um, tax filings behind them. I am pro- I am probably close to that. I have not been keeping count. And sometimes the, the definition of exactly what is a tax return is uh, slightly vague when you consider multi-state and multiple entities and things like that. But right, um, what I really wish is that I had a time machine so that I could go back to college and uh, maybe instead of uh, going into um, accounting, I could have gone into law. <laughs> That's funny because I think you talk to lawyers and some of them would say they'd rather have gone into accounting instead of law. So, and there are people that obviously prefer to go to it, go into business. And I had some friends who actually one really good friend who was a CPA when he became a law student, continued his CPA work while a law student, continued as a lawyer and a CPA, and then eventually became a businessman. So he did all three. Now he's he's very rich and living in Los Angeles as kind of a philanthropist. He's uh, at some point, hopefully, I'll get him to come on the podcast. But let's talk about a couple of things. One that I sent to you, which is quite interesting, is that today there was testimony from Mazars, the accountants for Trump, about the nature of their work for the Trump organization. Of course, the Trump organization and a bunch of other defendants, including Donald Trump, are being sued civilly, not criminally, at least not in this case, in New York for tax fraud <clears throat> as a, a civil penalty, which is going to result, I suppose, in some sort of fine, but not incarceration. And uh, they've put on Mazars, certain account from Mazars about the work that Mazars did. U- ultimately, Mazars resigned. This, of course, today was also a testimony from the attorney as well, Cohen, in which Cohen talked about inflating uh, various assets to reverse engineer certain numbers. And I, I just find it amazing the number of people that are basically now testifying against our former president. And uh, ultimately, it's like he's facing so many different cases. The one that's actively in trial now is in state court in new york on this civil tax uh charge which i've got to believe it's going to result in a number of things but it's interesting when you think about mazars and its role because you noted something i never paid attention to which is 
they never actually did audited returns for him, right? Apparently, the level of service that was provided is something called a compilation, where the accountant has almost no responsibility for the content of information that's prov being provided by the client. So it's more, and, it's more like the accountant is getting information in spreadsheets and then maybe checking the math to see if it adds up. I mean, even maybe not even necessarily doing that. Like, what is the role of the accountant in a compilation situation? I think that the, um, uh, the compilation report says that no assurance whatsoever is provided or similar language. And um, the duty of the accountant is only uh, that if they should, it's a, a sort of a negative assurance situation. If by some chance the accountant sees something that's obviously incorrect, then are required to withdraw from the engagement or not issue the report. But they're not doing any double checking on what asset values are and that sort of thing, right? They have no assurance duties whatsoever. The level of uh, dependence upon which an investor or a party to a transaction should place in such reports is zero or very close to zero. Right. So a bank getting a compilation report from bazaars, they should just say, look, we want an audited report. We want us, you to spend the money on an audit. We want an appraisal. We want multiple appraisals. Like if the banks were lending, and maybe this is the defense argument, if the banks were lending, regardless of getting audited and full appraisal type reports, then the banks were effectively lending because they kind of believed that Donald Trump would be good for the money. And, you know, the asset values really didn't matter. I mean, that's kind of been his defense up to now, which is these asset values can be stated left, right, and sidewards. They're not they're not really material. The material decision is that Trump's health is good and his reputation, at least up to this point, has been intact. And he's going to survive another day to basically make sure that he pays his debts um, when they when they're due. But I think this case is going to result if every signal goes in the direction it seems to be going. Seems like it's going to result in him losing control of his New York properties, because I think the judge has frozen all those properties and effectively said there's going to be a receivership as the end game here. So I don't know what the way this is going to play out. Maybe they're playing for an eventual appeal or something else. But it's interesting to read uh, what's going on, because it seems as though the more that unfolds day by day, the worse it gets for Donald Trump, at least in the big picture uh, point of view of things. So the second topic that I had was there seems to be a big hubbub about new form 1099K. Can you explain that to listeners and what it is that they're likely to receive or they're likely to generate and how they should play various moves? Because it seems as though the goalposts keep moving on what kind of reporting happens uh, under Form 1099, which most people think of as independent contractor compensation, but it's obviously covering lots of other things as well, right? Absolutely. This is a rapidly evolving area in tax compliance uh, on several levels. Um, the 1099 uh, was recently split into the 1099 and the 1099 NEC. And uh, now we have a new form, the 1099K, which is um, being issued by services similar to PayPal. Um, to uh, people who have more than $600 in gross proceeds from the activity. So like any online sale of, of used clothing and that sort of thing could result in a 1099 that, that even on eBay or on yes. Amazon or wherever? Yes, it could. And we advise our clients and when preparing tax returns for our clients, we will report these activities along with the offsetting expenses 
uh, for a business activity. Um, a hobby is not a business activity and uh, expenses in a hobby are not deductible. So um, you might, if you think you might be operating a hobby, then um, use caution and involve a tax professional in the preparation of your uh, tax return. And just as a general disclaimer, nothing I say or write uh, is intended as a tax opinion that people should rely on without consultation on their specific circumstances. These rules are constantly changing. So anything I say may be incorrect. Right. Well, we always have that sort of disclaimer. This is informational only, but just generally speaking, when you think about like people who sell stuff online, right? They're selling, sometimes they're selling used goods. I don't think they've thought about like all of the mechanics of what did I pay for that old fur coat? Did it go down in value? Probably. Did I lose money on it? Probably. When I receive, if I paid a thousand dollars for a fur coat and I received six hundred dollars in a eBay type sale, will I end up getting a 1099K as though I'm supposed to report income on something that I really had a loss of four hundred yes. dollars on? You are supposed to report the transaction, but if you report it correctly, um, as a capital loss that's personal in nature then it does not result in tax. So um, there's a way to present this, that these types of transactions in general that will um, avoid uh, creating um, undeserved taxes that are not properly owed. Right. And uh, hopefully right. that will, if presented properly, um, be a self-explanatory to the tax authorities and not create an audit and not create audit flags Right. But um, in general, for profitable activities, the 1099Ks reflect a minimum of the actual income that uh, is potentially taxable. And so uh, we check that um, the actual income that's being reported exceeds the, um, for profitable activities, um, exceeds the 1099K total. Um, but other than that, uh, in general, 1099Ks have no bearing or have very limited bearing on the tax returns we prepare. Well, so when people get 1099Ks from wherever they get them, do they think the way you're explaining it, which is, hey, you have to go back and trace what you did because on its face, it looks like you have income, right? Looks like you have taxable income. Well, if you are involved in a business activity, then you should have an income tracking system, whether it's single entry bookkeeping, double entry bookkeeping, reliance on estimates, um, reliance on activity reports from their bank. Um, all, all of these are potentially acceptable methods and um, your income should exceed the amount that you received through eBay or PayPal. Um, presumably you have other types of sales where you were paid by cash or check. And so the grand total if your bookkeeping system is properly functional, will be greater than the total of the 1099 case. And as long as that's the case, then the chance of being audited for that is relatively unlikely. Right. But in general, like for, let's, let's say people that are retired and have a really simple tax return, all of a sudden they start selling off some of their garage sale items, whatever they are, and they use an online system and they end up getting a 1099K, they probably don't have the records of what did they originally pay for that used refrigerator, right? They probably if somebody came to me with that situation, I would create a Schedule D capital gain or loss report showing um, personal items sold at a loss where the basis of the item exceeded the realized proceeds and I, under Circular 230, I'm allowed to rely on the estimates of the client for the dollar amounts um, received in the sale and the uh, dollar amount of basis cost. But um, if they have a 1099K, I would want to caution the client that their estimates should exceed the total of the 1099Ks 
in order to avoid creating an audit flag. Right. I mean, it's a. It seems like Congress. I think you mentioned there's sort of politics behind this. It seems like Congress is is delving in a tougher and tougher way on what I would call small transactions. Right. Like, wasn't there a different number before? Is a threshold? Isn't the threshold getting lower and lower? In terms yes. of the time how is that going and what are the politics of that? Yes, there used to be a $20,000 threshold um, reporting to 99Ks and it uh, declined to $600 so for what, the current uh, next year. And so um, that, I think there's an overall desire to reduce under reporting and um, under compliance. And I would not consider it a political issue, I think that the IRS and the lifetime civil servants within the IRS have analyses, as I suspect that they include the input of the taxpayer agents and taxpayer services to decide what areas to focus on that have the most benefit to government uh, revenue uh, without causing undue administrative costs to the uh, taxpayers or to the service. But it's a little weird because when you think about lowering it to 600 and obviously generating a lot more reporting, it's like you have these big, big, big billionaires like Donald Trump that are <clears throat> managing their taxes and also managing their real estate investments and their borrowing activities and their their balance sheets and their net worths and their income statements in ways that are so massive that we've got like a set of rules that seem to be pushing at the bottom rungs of society in a more aggressive way than the way the rules might be viewed as pushing towards the more upper echelon billionaire class that's out there. Like I would think in many ways that there would be a lot more emphasis on what I would call the billionaire rules um, and trying to make sure there's compliance there than kind of this very low level, hey, let's see whether mom or dad or grandpa or grandma sold the old refrigerator and got some money for it that they somehow made a profit on in some fashion, right? And earned income credit has been a big focus point in the past, in defense of the IRS, a portion of that concern is the re refundable nature of the earned income credit and um, the possibility of fraud by tax preparers and tax agents where um, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars in uh, fake tax returns can result in large cash refunds uh, and then the perpetrators are gone before the enforcement can happen. Um, but I do think that there's increasing focus lately on partnerships, high net worth, um, large corporations, and international transactions. So I don't, do not perceive necessarily an unfair focus on small taxpayers. Um, my personal philosophy is, is that there's not enough money there for anybody to care too much. And number two is that there's a social benefit to having enforcement be consistent at all levels. Enforcement at the very high income level has declined for decades. So that right now, high income taxpayers are being audited at a much lower rate than they were 20 years ago. And um, uh, there do seem to be some attempts to reform that and to uh, have a greater focus on millionaire and billionaire uh, taxes. And also there's been consideration of a wealth tax where the tax is not just focused on the annual taxable income, but on the total assets of the taxpayer. And that would be a profound change to the system. Right. I mean, let's talk about that for a minute because that really does affect a lot of folks in Silicon Valley that where there's great wealth generated, at least on paper, stock wealth some billionaires or some number of billionaires that get created every year in Silicon Valley, at least on on paper of what venture capitalists or 
valuing these startup companies, these unicorns at. How do you think it plays out when you think about federal taxes, state taxes, this potential for a wealth tax? There's been some talk in Palo Alto of maybe charging some type of of special real estate surtax based on real estate values or based on wealth of who owns what real estate in Palo Alto or in Santa Clara County. I mean, right now, when you add the taxes that could apply across the board in California, what what do you get as a grand total at the highest level? Isn't it above 40, 47% or is it less than that? When you add all the numbers together, not including the wealth tax potential. It really depends. And I don't have a good answer to that. So there's a lot of ways to defer taxes, including um, on real estate where you don't get taxed until you sell. And if you structure your trusts and estates, you never sell. And then uh, you get step up basis and nobody ever pays tax on the game. So um, there's also many taxes um, under many different names that hide the pain. So that in addition to the income tax, which you're probably talking about, there's a payroll tax that Mm -hmm. um, is at least a third of the revenue that the government um, generates. And that payroll tax is not progressive, it's regressive. Mm -hmm. So um, the uh, person who earns $130,000 a year or less is paying a much greater proportion of their um, income to the payroll tax than somebody who earns a million dollars a year or more. So now in terms of California versus other states, you have to look at the estate tax. California has no estate tax, mm-hmm. whereas many other states do. You have to look at the property tax, which is capped in California by Proposition 13. And in many other states, the sales tax and the property tax are higher. So it, it's a complicated um, analysis. And depending upon um, where you are, it could go either way. We recently had something called a NIT, N-I-I-T, a tax on investments, which is only 4%, but that's starting to tax assets, not just income. Um, Albeit it is on transactions of assets, but still it's a tax based upon that starts to affect wealth and not just affecting wages. And um, many high net worth um, taxpayers have uh, a lot of their income focused on partnerships. The rules there are extremely complex, and I think anything that can be done to simplify those rules, uh, whether it increases tax or decreases tax, even a a simplification would uh, result in increased fairness. Is the NIIT a federal tax? Yes, it is. What's the acronym? What's the four-letter acronym stand for? Um, Net uh, investment. I don't remember the rest. (laughs) Net investment something tax? Yeah. Is that it? N-I-I-T? I hadn't heard of that before. Yeah. And, and that's what is, what is a 4% it? tax on capital uh, transactions, including stock and real estate. And regardless of California or elsewhere, it's across the United States. Yes, it is. Right? It's It's been around for the last couple of years. I want to say it precedes the 2018 Trump changes, but I don't remember for sure. Uh, right. It's been around since at least 2018. So when you think about all this in your own practice, do you see complexity increasing as I do, or do you see somehow simplification occurring? Because to me, it just seems as though complexity is increasing dramatically over time. Now, maybe that's just the way of the world, but I don't I, I, don't I think there's a net increase. I think that um, there were some simplifying elements to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in 2018. So less people are itemizing than did before. But even there, um, change itself is a complexity. And um, having uh, different treatments in different years, and then um, with COVID, a whole lot of special rules, including net operating laws carry back for five years for a period of time, and uh, now there's no net operating loss carry back. There's just carry forward, but it's limited. You know, 
I benefit to some extent as a tax practitioner from the complexity because more people need help, but um, it allows us to create value. And so it's right. kind of job security for tax preparers. You know, we don't write the tax code. We help clients um, navigate the tax code. If uh, you're unhappy with the tax code, consider uh, the people you um, elect to Congress who write the tax code and um, find people who will actually simplify it. Well, I don't know that that's ever going to happen because there's such a huge bureaucracy and there's such a massive number of historical regulations on the books. It's almost like, I think it was Bill Bradley, you know, the famous basketball player who was a senator from New Jersey who ran, I forget what year he ran. I want to say it was like 2004, maybe for president, maybe even earlier than that. And I think a big part of his campaign was he was going to dramatically simplify the tax code and dramatically simplify reporting to where it could be done like on a postcard or something. And that just got no traction at all. And I don't know that anyone out there is is doing anything to suggest that there should be um, super simplification because it's almost like it's a monster. And if you touch it, uh, you might cause a worse outcome than just leaving it as as sick as it is uh, and just having people deal with it. But I could tell you that a lot of people are super confused. And as these regulations change and as they start to get uh, things like a 1099K and they're wondering, what what does this mean? I don't really have this income. This was from a yard sale or something. This was not really is a little online sale that I did of something I lost money on. Seems like a strange outcome to imagine, but that seems to be where the rules keep going, right? Well, um, they've added a K2 and a K3 to the um, pass-through K1 report. And these um, new forms are almost unintelligible, even to tax professionals. So there definitely have been increases in complexity. Um, I've seen some uh, lobbying pushback against simplification from the tax preparation companies, the H&R Block and Intuits of the world, who right. um, sell software for do-it-yourself tax preparation, have resisted the idea of a postcard-based tax because of the potential effect on their earnings. Right. No, and, it's, it's, big, it's big business, and clearly... There's a lot of incumbents that don't want to change the status quo. But in general, I think if you look at people every April or whatever date applies, they're never that happy with A, the complexity, B, the number of pages of forms that they have to generate or go through or get generated for them, or C, the amount of tax that they end up paying. And then when they see things like, oh, we're just going to give a few billion to Ukraine, a few billion to Israel, and a few billion to Palestine, they're like, you know, what what are we doing here? Like, why, why don't we have a better transportation system in the U.S. rather than being giving billions, if not tens of billions, um, to these overseas countries that ultimately get into wars and just destroy value as opposed to create value. So, you know, I'm probably sounding very conservative at this point, but I can tell you, it just seems as though there's a lot of money that is, is being uh, spent that maybe doesn't even get covered by taxes because we're running a deficit economy. And people have to wonder like, when, when does this ever get fixed? in what lifetime will this get fixed because it doesn't it doesn't seem to project in a way that we're ever going to imagine a more simplified and less taxing environment than what exists today which you know which is not how you've touched on many arguments and I, the one art piece i'd like to offer a rebuttal is that if um we ignore ukraine and it collapses and Russia then invades Poland and we are involved as a NATO 
um, signatory, I think our costs will be much higher. Yeah. But um, you, some of your other points are good points. But I, no, no, uh, I, look, I think it's a real mixed bag, and I don't see, I don't see a situation where it's going to be fixed in the short term. It seems like it's going to get worse, not better. I, I'm sure China has equally dramatic problems that they're facing. I'm sure Russia has even many more problems. Israel and and Palestine and folks in Gaza, of course, have huge problems as well. But as a general proposition, um, it seems as though we're 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 struggling to figure out solutions. And the more that we throw more computers at it, maybe it just increases the complexity as opposed to decreasing. Because of all the stuff we're done by hand. I think people would throw their hands up and say, this is an impossible task to get a tax return done. If you had to do it by hand, I think you would say the price of every tax return is going to basically go up exponentially because we can't do this stuff by hand. And if we do it by hand, the cost is just going to be too high. So you must simplify because there's no way you can get it done. The computers have actually enabled kind of greater complexity over time. Right. If you look at some of the writings about the collapse of the Roman Empire, um, a failure to efficiently collect taxes was one of the attributed um, causes of that collapse. And right. so uh, tax is certainly a, an important issue. You know, right. go, go back 100 years, there was no income tax. Right. And the government uh, sufficed with um, duties and, and taxes. But um so definitely simplification would be good. You know, I don't control that. I wish I did, but um, uh, maybe I don't even wish I did control it. But um, it's a definite challenge, and uh, it would be a big burden. It would be a big burden for anyone to control, and it's a big burden for anyone to even take up the mantle. And I don't think any of the candidates are even trying to do it. I think that they see it as that's an area that is beyond beyond hope and they're just shaking their heads saying you know at some point um maybe there'll be enough uh wealth maybe as a result of people being becoming more productive and computers and artificial intelligence and chat gbt and all the other tools that are coming into the picture enabling more of a a productivity boom IRS has a group called the um, Taxpayer Advocate, and they keep track of uh, their top issues in terms of uh, um, inefficiency in the tax process. And um, I think that um, uh, that's interesting information to keep track of. Uh, another online group, it's called the Cato Institute, right. and they have a lot of information about um, different approaches to taxation and some of the benefits and problems that are created and also a state-by-state -state comparison of um, uh, state and local taxes. Um, there's a group of uh, a caucus, I believe there's about 20 members of um, Congress people from both parties in both houses who um, are also CPAs, accountants. And um, I haven't heard too much from them lately, but if you Google, try and Google them, you can find out what they're up to. Wow, and, uh, I, I didn't know that, Steve. I didn't know that there were actually CPAs in office. I thought they were all lawyers. The, I think these are both. <laughs> I have both lawyers and CPAs. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, Steve, thanks for coming on and explaining uh, all that you've done. I really appreciate it. I haven't seen you for a while. I'm glad you're getting through tax season number whatever i'm sure it's in the 20s or 30s at this point and uh, you're doing well doing it and uh, people should should contact you if they have any tax issues you're still you're still operating full tilt and taking new clients so why don't you give people your phone number so that they can reach you my cell phone is 408-887-6433 at steve rabin R A B S and Bravo I N C P A, and you can Google me and find out 
about tomorrow about what we do. Uh, thank you for having me, Jack. Oh, it's a pleasure. Yes. Welcome. Um, good, good seeing you. We'll talk to you again. Take care. Indeed. You too. Bye-bye. Tune in next time on The Valley Current.